looking for a real quick mic check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six. Drew, you want to go? I got both, either one. Green mic check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Blue mic. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Bill, we're good there. I'm going to go ahead and leave everything on. I'm going to mute them. Four. Test three, two, one.
Good afternoon. Welcome to the open forum for our presidential candidates for Carl Sandburg College. I'm Connie Thurman. I am the Dean of Institutional Effectiveness and Human Resources at Carl Sandburg College. And just to share with you the process of open forum, uh, please uh, quiet your cell phones. And at the time that you'll have an opportunity to ask questions, um, mics will be passed, so wait if you can until a microphone is handed to you before you ask your question. We have an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, we'll, our candidate will have an opportunity to share her vita and the reason why she wants to be the president at Carl Sandburg College. And most of you know Dr. Ellen Crow. She is our current vice president of academic services, and we welcome her. And Dr. Carl, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's a little more crowded than it was earlier, so welcome. Um, the first thing I would like to say, and I mean this in the most sincere way that I can say it, is thank you for taking the time and being a part of the process for all the candidates that are here because you're facing one of the most important um, decisions that an institution can face. Um, and Choosing the next president is a critical part of the mission of a college and the sustainability of an institution. So in all sincerity, I appreciate your participation in the process. So with that, I'll start with my uh, Vita. And um, it's so funny because today I've probably talked more about myself in however many hours I've been here than I probably have in the last four or five years. So it's not easy for me to talk about myself or the things that I've done. And 
Um, but I'm happy to share that with you because I think it'll give you a, a, a good perspective of where I've been and how I how I came to be here because it really has been a journey for me. So I started in education working for special school district of St. Louis County. St. Louis Special School District is and uh, was at that time an icon for the country for providing special services. We provide special services, everything from the bus drivers to occupational and speech therapy to special education to over 25,000 children. We have an employee field of over 5,000 employees in 22 school districts. We have our own buildings and, um, and are also housed within the local schools themselves. So it's quite an operation. It was one that I was extremely proud to join and I was considered a self-contained teacher, which wasn't something that I was really particularly proud of a title, but <laughs> self-contained meaning that I taught all the academic areas for individuals with disabilities. There were varying age groups and various range of disabilities. So I was, responsibility, I was responsible for their academic progress, and we were technically tenants in um, other districts' buildings. So I enjoyed that. It was, uh, and it's an experience when you want to see the world through somebody else's eyes, go in a classroom with people. And, and one of my favorite activities would say, why don't you draw me? Just, you know, it didn't matter what age they were. I'd say, do a drawing. I mean, if you want to see what you look like and your perspective, have somebody draw you because all your characteristics come out. So, um, I did that and I pursued my master's degree and my graduate degree and during that time I also, and I don't really re realize how I did it, I was also a, a, a high school coach, I worked for a non-for-profit and I was a special tutor, a tutor for after school things as well. So I don't, and then I was also going to school at the same time and looking back now I think I should be more tired than I am. But um, So those were great years and I really enjoyed myself. and. We were tenants in other buildings. We serviced the students within that district. However, I had two bosses. I had the principal of the building, and then I also had our district administrator. And my life changed rather abruptly at one point working for special school district, and that was, we were, it was mid-year, we were gonna move our classroom from one classroom, from one building in the district to another building and that building had just built a beautiful wing and we were we were going to be in the basement but we were going to be in the wing and it it was a, a an exciting time for the kids there were going to be a new desks and new classrooms new friends new teachers and we try to make it as positive as we could and my first meeting with the principal I walked in to, to introduce myself and say we are so excited to be here and we're just thrilled and she turned to me and said I don't, I want you to know something. I don't want you here and I don't want those students here. And I don't like you and I don't like your students. And I was like, okay, you know, nice to meet you and let's just move forward. And I looked at my administrator and my administrator did nothing. And it was, I think, a real eye-opening moment for me because I knew that there were, you know, some hard feelings about different students and different types of people, but it was the first time that I really felt like I couldn't defend them and I was not going to allow that to continue if I could control it. So I wanted to make a change. I wanted to make a change for my students. I wanted to make a change for teachers and be an advocate for them. So I told myself when a position opened in administration, I was going to try and get that position and if I got it, I would make a difference. Well. Shortly after that, a position opened and I applied for it in the administration and I became an administrator for special school district and I was what they considered an area coordinator. So I was essentially the administrator for all special services in three major school districts. So I did everything from the bus drivers to the speech pathologist and the physical therapist and supervised that. And yet I felt like I really wasn't making an impact where I wanted to make an impact. And so um, an opportunity opened for a faculty position at McMurray College. And um, McMurray College is a small liberal arts institution in Jacksonville. 
Illinois, and I thought, I'm going to go and I'm going to teach special, I'm going to teach these people how to be a teacher, how to advocate for their students, and I'm going to make a difference. So I got really excited and went, and I was a faculty um, in a program of one for me. It was it. I was the only faculty member of special education and um, loved it, loved it. Just knew that I was making a difference. I was giving people real life experiences and knew that I was going to impact these students and then their students would be impacted by that. And it was a, a great time for me. And so I b eventually became the program chair. And meanwhile, I was also the faculty advisor, so I advised all the students. Then I moved to um, department chair and continued to teach and continued to do the advising. And then it, uh, we had administrative changes at McMurray, and it was very sad for me because M McMurray's cornerstone was that they had a thing called the core curriculum. Everybody went through that curriculum. Everybody did. They were considered essentials readings of the period of time. And so everybody hated core. You know, they had the students had T-shirts made up of I survive core. And so it was really, truly the bedrock of some of McMurray. And so new administration came in and um, core was taken away and enrollment kind of dropped and it, the feeling changed on campus, and so there was an opportunity at Quincy University to become the Dean of School of Education, and I thought, I, I can do that, I would like to do that. I really, I, I wanna continue to make an impact, and I felt like I wasn't anymore, and so I went to Quincy University, and we provided um, every, we had both graduate and undergraduate. I taught, I was the Dean, we had a satellite campus in, in Springfield that we also did distance education with, as well as offered um, classes there. And so again, I felt like I was really doing something that was the right place for me at the right time. But what was important to me was the feeling that I got when I went to Quincy University because I had, I we did have internet, but I chose to drive my application to QU. And I felt that I'm very much a behavioralist, and I have to I I have to feel it and see it and not just hear it. So I pulled up at QU and I had the application on the side, and I thought, okay, I'm going to see what happens, and if it's right, I'll know it's right. And so I stepped out. It was a beautiful sunny day. If you haven't been to Q, QU's campus, you should go. It's beautiful and it's well maintained. And stepped out. Had three people come up to me, and almost one right after another, and asked me if they could help me if I needed directions. Um, they all gave me the directions, and I told people this morning they all were the same directions, and they were right, which was unusual. And um, so I went in and I thought, yes, this is this is where I want to be. I went into the building and I also, when I was in Jacksonville, had rehabbed a pre-Civil War house at night. And um, so I love old things and I love tradition. And so I walked into those buildings. I'm like, this is just phenomenal. This is where I need to be. So I put in my application and got that position. So QU gave me a lot of um, exposure. It gave me exposure to dual credit. It gave me exposure to uh, proprietary partnerships with businesses and organizations. It gave me um, the distance education. It gave me a breadth of knowledge in um, sports management because in the School of Education, we had not only education, we had counseling, we had sports management. We had, I started a sign language interpreting program there. Um, so it was, it was broader than just education. So I really felt like this is a good opportunity. And um, that, that proprietary partnership that I started um, was actually in Chicago. And so it was kind of uh, an organization built similar to Teachers for America and that sort of thing. But basically what they did was a non-traditional program at the graduate level where we created teachers for high need areas and in um, such as bilingual 
or special education. And so these people were actually hired as teachers. They were going through courses at the same time. It was really what I would consider kind of ahead of its time as far as teacher preparation. Um, and it was a very hands-on approach with these people. We also um, had started at QU a, a professional development school. So we were actually teaching our courses of our students in the schools themselves. So the students were working with students, taking their application from the courses and taking it right out in the population. So that was another kind of innovative thing we had done. And But I really got hooked into this whole idea of of where I was with the proprietary side of of teacher preparation and and Chicago and and the areas of need and I thought I, I, I I'm ready to move and so I did and I went to the proprietary side completely and worked for an institution or a system called Westwood and all to colleges and that is a unique experience and I don't recommend it for everyone but it's it really um, opened up my eyes to the business side of a college and how you really have to operate things and when you're looking at profit and loss and in return on investment plus um, I, it opened up I was considered the dean of the campus but that's because we were part of a system so that was the highest position pretty much that you could go at um, and so it gave me the operational side as well so financial aid, student services, admissions, advising, recruiting, all of those things. I got all of those experiences. So it was actually a, a, an incredibly educational opportunity for me. Well, I know it's going to come to a surprise to all of you, but politics started to play a role in the state of Illinois with proprietary <laughs> education. And Lisa Madigan kind of swung her sights onto us and being in Chicago we were a prime target. So it started to get a little warm in being underneath the microscope. So I thought I need to start probably thinking about another life choice. So I happened to meet the um, provost of Morton College, Mutasar Siddiqui, and Dr. Siddiqui was a f is a phenomenally intelligent and wonderful and um, great mentor and he he was nice enough to give me the position of um, Dean of Career and Technical Education when I applied at Morton College. And I felt like I had a place where I could really grow because of that kind of mentorship. And so um, I was at Morton College as the Dean of Career and Technical Education there. I also oversaw community and continuing education. I grew our dual credit because um, our credit, our dual credit program at that time was generally CTE or career and technical education, and I expanded it over to the liberal arts side. So I really, as Dr. Siddiqui was there, I really felt like I had any opportunity that I wanted to take. We grew our partnership with Ford, um, the Ford Company, Apple, Snap-on Tools a variety of businesses in the area. Um, UPS, we started a supply chain management um, certificate with them. So I really started to see a lot of growth. And unfortunately, Dr. Siddiqui um, felt that he needed to expand his horizons and moved on to the state of Texas. And at that point in time, I felt like I, I I was open to new opportunities and shortly after that there was the position for vice president of Carl Sandburg College. And much like um, I did with Quincy University, I thought I'm going to wait and see how I feel about this before I do it. It's a big, it's a big jump for me. And so I came to the campus and saw the campus and um, the feeling I got was even better than the one I got at QU, and I didn't think I could. I didn't think I could ever replicate that. And so, I thought, okay. And so then I go and I went on your website. And when you click on your website, and I know you guys have all been here, so maybe you don't have that feeling. When I click on the website, and I still have that feeling today. When I click on the website, that's a cool place. That is so phenomenal. It's beautiful. And it just, you just feel like you want to be there. And some places on some of those pages, you feel like you're there. And so I went ahead and I um, 
filled out the application, went through the interview process, and now I've been for the last seven months your vice president of academic services. And why would I like to be your president? I, um, I can't really explain it. I've tried to put words to it. Um, there's a feeling here, and I met with the students earlier, and the students pretty much said the same thing, that when you're here, you feel like you're a part of something. And I would like to continue to be a part of something, and I would like to continue that feeling and strengthen that feeling for people. And I would like this institution to continue to have that opportunity to share that feeling with people. And um, it's been, you know, for no other word, I know I've had conversations with people. It's like a family, you know. And um, I said this this morning. There's a line down here. You guys can't see it. My family is, you know, where we sit and we're probably our biggest arch enemies when we're all together because we try to figure out how to get each other and those kind of things. But, you know, or we'll be like, did you see what, you know. And But if any of you tried to do anything to any of my family, that line comes up and you don't cross that line, you know. And that's how I feel here. I don't want anybody to cross that line with Carl Sandberg. And um, I just, it it is a place that, is important to me and has become a part of me in an, an incredibly short time. Um, the people here make the difference. When you talk to the students, what is important to them, what has been the best thing about here, it is the faculty and it's the people that they know. And one student said today, I didn't, you know, I'm in, in, you want to understand education, listen to the acronyms that are coming out of our students. They're the same that come out of somebody that's been in administration for 10 years. It's I'm part of MOD, WOC, and, you know, and it goes on and on and on. And, and then the one woman said, and I didn't want to be a part of any of those things. They came to me. And I was like, that's right, because you feel yourself pulled in and you just want to be here. And it would be an incredible honor and privilege to be able to lead us into the next 5, 10, 20 years for my lifetime, I'm not counting on your guys, I'm just mine, to to do that and to, to continue a, what a strength and strong institution it is and to continue that. And it would be it would be a great opportunity and one that to me is almost overwhelming. And um, the responsibility I feel for the people that are here and for the program that are here and the students that are here, it's, it's something that I just don't take lightly, and it, it would just be a privilege to be able to do that. And I, I hope you realize that feeling that you generate in people. And if you don't, if you don't feel it, probably need to have some kind of discussion or we need to, to you know, kind of figure out why, because you really can't go hardly anywhere here and not feel that way. So... I think I've covered what you asked me to cover in the beginning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, there's a shock. <laughs> Hello. I believe Sandberg is well positioned in regards to financial stability. However, decreasing population, instability in the state financial position, and regulatory burdens continue to take a toll. Could you reflect on these topics and share how you would propose to maintain financial stability and how you will make the difficult decisions as to what should be funded and what might need to wait? Why did you have to type that? <laughs> <laughs> that's such a simple... That's my question. <laughs> that's, that's such a simple question, Lisa. Uh, I think it's. I think that's a reality that we all need to look at. Is how do you continue to sustain something that um, you know you really care about in the first place? And I think that as I think in several ways, Sandberg has done some really smart things. They've cut out as much as 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 we can the reliance on state funding, and I think that's an important thing because then it's just you know, additional funding, and that's great. I think we need to look and to explore grant opportunities. 
the the problem with grant and in, inner um, opportunities is how do you sustain those then once once you've expired the grant. Um, I think we need to look at what are we doing well, give it support, and then what can we do better? Where are we not as operationally strong as we need to be? And so some of the areas that when I walked in the door that I identified, I would say in the majority of the career side, we need to really give it some attention. We need to look at, we may need to make sure that we're creating um, occupations for students and that that's a good thing. We need to look at how we do it. Not everybody is here for a credit and they shouldn't be here for a credit. Can we make some some opportunities available to people and and not need the tuition and make it a, a cost, you know, enhancing sort of thing, situations such as like a customized um, training and what can we do within the institution to do some of those things. There's a whole movement now to do digital badging and, you know, create those digital badges that you empower your students or empower people in front of it that um, I haven't seen anything much on MOOCs here. Can we incorporate some of that technology and some of the interest in that and create those? What can we do that sets us that we do well. I mean, number one in technology, we need to just continue that excitement and continue that momentum. We um, we need to see what other rural districts are doing. Yeah, uh, yesterday I read an article on how Google is uh, creating uh, what they call rolling study halls, and so they've Wi-Fi'd the buses because kids in rural school districts spend so much time on buses. So how can they, you know, help? And so Google's paying for all of those. And so I think we need to look at some of those ideas and say, okay, what can we take from that? What can we do? We have a mobile maker, the trailer. We need to, how can we access that? How can we get good exposure from that? It's a great tool. Why aren't we, you know, pulling that more? And I think we need to make everybody aware of what everybody else does and how when you make a decision, it looks really good in your area, but then you forgot everybody else. And that's one of the things that um, I, I talked about this morning, you know, I had no idea until I started studying satisfactory uh, academic progress and had to talk to students, and it, it hurt my heart to say, you just got to get a D. You just got to get through this class, and that's really hard, you know, when you're supposed to be the academic leader going, just get that D, pal get through this, you know, and because it's about completion and people, a lot of people don't understand that. People that haven't, you know, faculty, they, why, why would faculty need to know about financial aid? Because they need to understand what impacts that student as far as completion, you know, um, and they need to understand that, yeah, could the student have worked harder and gotten a B? Yeah, but right now we got to get this kid through and then otherwise they lose financial aid you know, because they're on dismissal. And so I think we need to have those kind of conversations. And I think we need to, not that everybody should be an expert in financial aid, nobody, mm -mm, mm -mm. Um, I already know, no. And, um, but I think we need to at least get that as kind of a concept that's, you know, oh yeah, I gotta remember that, or I gotta think about that before we make some of those decisions. So I think we need to, we need to strengthen what we're doing well, and then I think we need to look at areas where we could probably really give some support and really get it going again. And, I, you know, we should be a leader in the community as far as um, academics and as far as uh, just some kind of interest as far as whether it's a community-based project or whatever. We need to be the leaders in that. And that's district wide. So we also need to know what's in our district and where the strengths are. So maybe if it's maybe if the field of a large veterinarian, large animal veterinarian has gone away, maybe we're really looking at, okay, how can we support that area? What can we do to at least give some kind of support in, in employment in employees? So I think it's knowing our district too. Good afternoon. You ready? <laughs> Good afternoon. How come they don't have to introduce themselves? Like, my name is Misty Lyon. I'm the I, dean of student I, success. I, I think we've met maybe once or twice. Seen everyone. Hello. <laughs> I'm Ellen Crow. I'm candidate number two. 
Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, Sandberg is somewhat unique in that we employ several full and part-time academic advisors to assist students with registration and creating academic plans and you know all over general support. Um, can you speak to um, Sandberg's advising model, kind of how that compares to previous institutions, and what is your philosophy on advising? I think it's important. You know, I mean, what I what I it's different than it is at other institutions. At other institutions, you don't even have to see an advisor. You know, you can register online, and then you get the the student coming that's taken four classes that they didn't need, and they're like, well, why did I take these classes? I don't know. Why'd you sign up for them? You know, but um, as, a, as a faculty member, and when I was advising, I saw how important that was. I got to have a lot of good conversations with students, especially like, well, take this class now. I can't because, you know, my kid is here and doing that. So it really built a relationship with me with the students. And so I think that one-to-one -one advising, and sometimes I can, I could have a conversation with a student about another faculty member or something that they didn't feel comfortable because saying to, to that faculty member, and it was a way for the, me to offer a different perspective, um, but it helped because they didn't feel threatened, their grade wasn't going to be threatened or anything because I wasn't teaching them. So it, it gave them another, to me, another layer of support. So I think it's good. I think it's a good model. I think it's important, especially here, because you want to know what your students are doing, and you want, I think it would, I would hope that it would help with persistence and retention. Um, I think I think we need to get better about sharing some of that information, perhaps, and um, making sure we're clo closing that communication loop. And um, and I think uh, really embracing the fact that the students are all of our responsibilities, no matter what role you play here, you know. And it doesn't matter because I may have made. A, you know, a friendship or a relationship with somebody, I don't know how, in financial aid, but um, that, you know, I can go talk to that person, you know, and, and they may know something and they should say something to somebody else. And I really think you can give good comprehensive services when you have that kind of relationship. I'm Jennifer Holmes. I'm an advisor and um, I was retention just to specialist. Give her a hard time. What? I was just trying to give her a oh. hard time. <laughs> well, you might not know me. Um, everybody's worried about retention. Are there any retention uh, policies that worked at your former places of employment that you think we might apply here? Just, I mean, I don't need a bow by bow plan, but just off the top of your head. I think there are a number of things that we can do. We need to start looking at scheduling and how we're putting our classes in. I think particularly when you're looking at the CTE side and you're trying, and, and no offense to anyone, but you're trying to fit in the gen eds because they're not here for the gen, general education pieces. But, you know, it's really about trying to get them to understand that importance. A lot of students will put those off towards the end and, you know, trying to make sure that we're building schedules where we can have students here and maximize their time. So that's one piece. I think another piece is that communication. I think a lot of people have some really good communication about students and we're not always, we don't always know it. We don't even know what we know sometimes and it's about having those conversations and sharing that information about students. Um, so I think looking at that, maybe looking at how we're offering courses um, whether it's face-to-face -face or online or hybrid. I know nursing has taken on that um, piece of um, offering a hybrid CNA. Uh, I'll call it CNA. I know it's not called that. Um, but where the lecture piece is online and then the hands-on is. And so that really helps our students in Carthage. And so I think having some of those conversations of, this is great, how can we do this you know, better, and how will it, how can we transport it throughout the district, or can we not, you know, and so I think it's those kind of conversations, because I think sometimes we get so tunnel vision, we don't think about that, and that's the same thing about making those decisions kind of here, and not realizing what it does as a kind of a, an effect out, 
So I think I think those are two pieces I would I would really suggest we look at. You're going to get a repeat question. I'm the mic person. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> what role does um, do you believe uh, athletics play? Um, in college, in junior college, as well as uh, what does your involvement look like as the next president? In athletics? I'm not playing. In athletics. <laughs> I mean, I heard that you could, you know, do a little bit of running. Mm -hmm. Those days are long gone. <laughs> uh, I think athletics, I think any, if you, if you had sat at the lunch today, that's impressive. I think any extracurricular or co-curricular things that we can give to our students it creates that feeling of, I belong here, um, I'm a part of this, and uh, athletics plays a huge part in my life. It played, it, it gave me relationships with people that I would never have, and so it gave me experiences that I would never have. I went to places that I never would have gone to. Um, I had interactions both positively and negatively with people I never would have had it with. So for me, athletics was very important. Um, do I think it's any more important than the student organizations? Absolutely not. Do I think it's more important than theater? No. I think you don't want to hear me sing, you know. So, um, but those things, all of those things are important, and I think we need to support them. Are they costly? Yes. So I think we have to be smart about how we do them, and I think we need to see what other support we can generate for those. But I think they give, I think they give a lot to the student that they wouldn't have. And I think we need to remember too where we're located. This may be the only college experience a student has, and so you want to give them as full of an experience as you can. And to me, um, athletics is. Is, you know, is part of that experience, just like all the other um, pieces. I was the student advisor to uh, two or three student organizations at McMurray. I thought it was really important to, to do that. Um, I, I stepped in as golf coach when they lost that one. Um, I stepped in as assistant softball coach. You know, I just think that you have to kind of I'm not going to do that here. I'm just going to tell you that right now. Um, but I think that it's that important. You know, those students really depend on those things, and it really adds a lot. And it give, you see people grow in ways that you wouldn't see them necessarily in the classroom, and I think it transfers over to the classroom a lot. My name is Margie Clay. Hi. I don't know if you've really met her. <laughs> anyway, I was a student out here back in the 80s. And back then, it was more of a coming back to get a second career. Mm -hmm. There was older students. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I feel I talk to some of the older adults, and they don't feel comfortable doing online classes. They've mm -hmm. said that to me. Mm -hmm. They want to be in lecture classes. And I know we have to move with the technology, educational moves, but how are we going to make them feel comfortable? Or are we beyond that? I mean, I feel like they're forgotten. <laughs> you know, and also adult ed. We used to have, you know, an adult ed program, and I mm. feel that's still necessary. And mm. I don't know. I think that's part of community college, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. you know? My father is 90. He still goes to uh, St. Louis Community College and swims. And so he's never graduated. We've always tried to give him a hard time. He's been going there for about 15 years. I'm like, Dad, it's a two-year institution. <laughs> but I think, I think it's important. He, he, he sees the community college as an important part. And the reason I tell you that is also because they don't have Internet and they don't have cable. And so going there <laughs> is a kind of a culture shock at times. But... Um, I recognize that, and not everybody learns in the same way. I don't think I would enjoy an online textbook. I think there, yet I have friends that just, you know, c consistently read and consume book after book after book online. So I think we always have to keep in mind that it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with your age. It has to do with your learning style. And so I think we have to always address different learning styles for individuals, and we have to try to give them those opportunities. Um, 
I'm not sure that I would do well in an online class, and I don't want to ever think that we've moved beyond something if that's what the community needs or, or wants. So I think we just have to make sure that we're smart about how we offer them. And, you know, if it's a situation where you have somebody that kind of wants to explore that, we have the hybrid and uh, opportunities and, you know, the, the multi um, the multi-task opportunities, offerings, and so they can kind of experiment with it a little bit if they want to do a little online or do the the robots. And I think by by offering those multi-modalities that help somebody kind of make that transition if they want to stay face to face, we just got to make sure that those are available to them and and that we're doing it in a smart way. And as far as adult ed and those kind of things, I think you, you know. You, there's a need, and if we can't physically offer them ourselves, I think we need to support the agencies that do. And um, I think you have to always be mindful of there are things that you want to do. There's accrediting bodies that are watching you, and then there's a budget that you have to keep in front of you at all times. So it's, it's not an easy juggling act, but I think, you know, in some way or another, we always have to go back and assess, should we be doing this, you know, or should we continue to yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like uh, preschool. You know, a lot of those those things, the state says zero to three, zero to three, zero to three, but then they cut the uh, early childhood teaching certificates and programs. So it's kind of hard to do that when they're not supporting it. So. Hi, Alan. Hi, James. <laughs> I even smiled for you. I know. That was kind of what took me back. Yeah, yeah. As you know, we have experienced a huge decrease in faculty numbers over the last 10 years or so, about a 25% decrease. And in an age of us always doing more with mm -hmm. less, as the president, how would you support faculty as their administrative roles increase and their time decreases? And secondly, what do you think a good faculty administrative structure looks like? Hmm. I feel that this is a loaded question. <laughs> um, I think, well, first off, I, you know, I think all, all institutions are unfortunately seeing a decline in full-time faculty. And not re I, don't, I don't think it was too long ago that there was an article out about some of the uh, the the faculty and the numbers of faculty at different institutions. And I believe, though, that this institution has the same ratio for, like, full-time and adjunct as it did 70% 70, 70 adjunct and 30%. So that's, that's interesting that that balance is kept, you know. Um, however, I think you always want to have full-time faculty. I mean, you always, because you always want somebody associated with the program because that really gives that connection to that student. So when you can, I think that's, that's the direction you want to go. You don't want to try to do it through an adjunct piece. But um, unfortunately, as enrollment declines, you have to make some of those decisions. And so usually when you can't fill the classrooms, those are where the, the faculty decline comes in. I think as, as those challenges come on, we need to look collectively of what can we do to strengthen the, the, the faculty because everywhere you go people are going to say it's it's faculty you know what do you remember it was the faculty you know they don't remember who the vice president was they don't remember who the president was it's always that faculty connection so I think we need to support our faculty and um, look at where can we increase, if we can increase enrollment maybe in one program and it will, the supporting classes, then we can give some support there. So I think we have to look at it strategically. Um, I, I wish that I had some magic thing that we could bring enrollment and that, you know, and just bring the numbers up but there's, there's not an easy solution to it. So I think what we really have to do is see what we're good at and strengthen those, and then where are those areas of opportunities, and strengthen those so that we can create some more full-time uh, faculty positions. That would be, you know, that would be a great goal. 
about the additional duties and the things that are added on to faculty. I, I think one of the things I have noticed here is that everybody wears about six different hats. And um, one of the best experiences, the way to see it is I went to a Cardinals and Cubs game when I was in college and there was this little guy sitting there and I was at St. Louis and he had he had a hat that had two bills and on the front was St. Louis and on the back it, so he had literally taken a Cubs hat and a Cardinal hat and sewn it around so he would when the Cubs were winning he was a Cubs fan when the St. Louis was winning he was a St. Louis fan and you know that's what I see a lot of here but they've got about four or five bills you know so I think one of the things I think we need to look at is can we find if we we, we need to find a way to lighten that load. And it might be through some technology that we didn't know about or we didn't explore. So can, can we do some of those, those tasks through some other artificial way and lighten it that way? And that would be great. And then free people up to do the things that they really want to do. Um, wh what, um, what are they doing? Are we making the best use of people? What are other people not doing? You know, could they, can we do it that way? And then I, I would hope that we could bring additional people in, but I, I don't know. I think you really have to sit and look at where we are and where those areas of need are. Um, the ideal faculty administration role is whatever is best for the institution. And so that structure to me should not be, oh, you have to do it this way in each department, you have to do it this way in each program. I think it's really about having the conversations with the people that are involved in those programs and finding out what structure fits. Some of the accrediting bodies require you to have certain positions, so you don't have leeway that way. And if those programs aren't accredited, students aren't going to come. So you really have to, you, you have to keep that in mind as well, that there's a certain structure for some of those, uh, those programs that are accredited. But I think it's about having that conversation with the person. If this structure is not working, why isn't it working? And what can we do to make it a better structure? And, it, and if it's not because it's not um, creating a, a good flow for the college or for the institution or it's not the best util utilization of resources, we need to look at that. And, and to me, it, might ch it should change. If the institution changes or the program changes, we need to look at it and change it as well. Hello, Robert Wolpert. I'm a student here and tutor in the tutoring center. As a non-traditional student here at Sandberg, what plans or ideas do you have to help recruit more non-traditional students and or making classes more accessible and easy to them? I think we have to look at, this is probably one of the first institutions that I've been at that there's not more evening classes, and I'm not saying that we do evening classes, but there was a conscious decision to do that. There was a conscious decision to go to four days a week. All of those things were made, obviously, with things in mind. So I think we have to look at, um, and I would assume from everything of, of me being here is it was based on students and the need of students because everything here is student focused. So again, I would say we go back to the students, to the non-traditional students. What, what is it you need? I um, ran programs where we ran them in the evenings and they were eight week and eight week and then they were two classes stacked on each. And so the student was full time, in, but you know, a very short time commitment. And so I think we need to look at that. What is it that a, a non-traditional student needs? And um, you, you never know because now a non-traditional student isn't just age sort of thing. You know, it's somebody who's coming back, somebody who has a family. Those are those kind of things that were not, you know, typical. Now everybody's taking their year off. And for some of us, like if I had done it, it been like five or ten years off. Um, but... You know, we need to we need to understand what is it that the students need and what would help them best. And so it's reaching out into the communities, into the districts. Is it is it online? Is it hybrid? What is it? Is it face to face? Is it weekend? Is it Friday Saturday? What is it? You know that we can do that would help students.
Dr. Crow, I uh, don't think it takes too much for genius to realize we're not the only ones in financial trouble. And I notice it seems to be a current strategy for a lot of schools that are in financial trouble to start marketing their online classes. Mm -hmm. When I first came here, I served on an ad hoc committee for probably two, two maybe three years. And we set many goals for our future in online, so many courses online by a certain date and whatnot. And I think we were making good progress with that. However, when accreditation come up, problems with HLC, problems with, with the ADA, it just kind of went away. Mm -hmm. So what I'd ask you is where do you see online learning in Sandberg's future? I think it, it's an important part. I think um, I've had discussions with some of the faculty here about really let's, we need to look at our online classes. I think we could set ourselves apart with online classes because a lot of online classes you go in and there's no direction, there's no face to, you know, there's no real interaction. We could really be, that could be an area where we could really lead, we could really drastically change the presentation in those onlines and the interactions that are available. And you have some really creative people. If you go on um, already doing things, and like I said, through those MOOCs or other people, and it, it's really about trying to get an idea of how can we do this better. Because I think online, you know, it, it is attractive to a lot of people. And I think we'd have a better success rate if we could change the format and really create an interactive piece on that online. And so, um, you know, it's always those accrediting bodies that give us trouble, isn't it? That <laughs> come in and stop things. Or, but I think, you know, sometimes it's it is good to take a pause and go, okay, we got we got to make sure we're doing this right. And so, um, I, I fully encourage that. I think that faculty. Faculty can be incredibly um, creative when just let go, you know, or they're very good. Most of the people that I've worked with as faculty and including myself, it's like, here, try it this way, or did you think about this, or do this. They're very sharing, and, but I think that's an area where we could really accelerate and, and be a leader, and I know we're part of Sarah which is uh, the consortium and the agreement for across state and international students. That's an area that if the federal government doesn't get too involved in, and um, we, we could really accelerate and, and use those agreements that we have. So uh, I think it's a great opportunity. I think that you have a lot of people internationally as well as across the country looking for certain classes and looking for certain things. We would do that with our own students if we weren't offering it. Go see who's offering it and then see if we can bring it in, those kind of things. So I think it's a real opportunity. Violence and school safety, or school shootings, are certainly a concern of mine as both a parent and an employee. So can you talk about any resources, training, or plans that you might have to um, conquer campus safety? I think that's, I think that's um, on everybody's mind, first off. And I think it's unfortunate when you're a community college trying to trying to keep that in mind and yet not close your campus off, you know, and especially this campus. I mean, there are so many um, access points and so many places that are, are fabulous, and then if you closed them off, you would lose those kind of pieces. But I know that um, Mr. Norton and um, Dr. Sunberg and myself, those are things that we discuss quite frequently. We just recently discussed um, like a protest policy or allowing students to gather and those kind of things. It's, it's unfortunate. It's a reality. Um, I think that you always want to go and see people that have gone through the experiences and learn from them. But what you will also know is that no matter how well you're prepared, you're never going to be able to prepare for every um, circumstance no matter how well you're guarded so I think it's one of those things that everybody needs to continue to remind each other to do and to we need to keep this on our forefront and our focus and I think that when opportunities for to go and learn anything pop up 
you do that. You follow and you send the people that need to be there. I think it's also about empowering everybody on the campus, including the students, that if there's something going on, you need to say something and that that's a good thing. And if it turns out that it's nothing, that's great, you know. And so I think a lot of, I, and I can only speak for myself, that a lot of us have gotten to the point where we were, have gone through experiences where we were told not to say anything, you know, just don't look, don't, don't, you know, don't get involved. And I think that's been kind of um, what you see coming through fruition now is that people don't always get involved. People are afraid to say things and we need to, we need to know that we're our own advocates and make, make it a safe place. But I think as far as trainings or anything that's available, you always see where um, leaders of institutions that have gone through these kind of things, those are some of the things that you really want to attend because they've lived through it. They know what they didn't do. And so that can kind of help you. This has to be one of the, aside from a campus that was not a, a community college campus, this is one of the safest campuses as far as I've seen with like the darkened windows and um, some of the access codes and those kind of things. Those were things that are, not every institution or every um, community college has. So I know that there, this institution has been very mindful of that ahead of it. So. You've spoken a lot about keeping the lines of communication open, which I totally agree with. Um, would you be able to speak to how you would go about communicating with staff, keeping those lines open, much like faculty have their once a month assembly, how you would go about talking to staff and keeping those lines open as, as a whole? Mm -hmm. I think you have to, I think we have to, I do, I need to understand, you know, the scheduling of everyone and understand uh, the different impacts of trying to do that um, and making sure one of the things that I think everybody needs to hear the same message, you know, and we need to kind of try to hear it at the same time. Um, so, you know, I'm not opposed to, I, I've been in institutions where we've done open forums or we've done town halls or whatever. And I think we really need to be mindful of what best suits people. So if it's a, just an email communication or whatever, I'm not really good at that. I really like my my um, associate deans will tell you I you know I pop up and you know or I'll just say hi. Um, so um, and I I'm not really in my office a lot and that's very frustrating for them. So. Um, cause I, I just kind of like to get out and see what's going on. And, um, I, I, they're trying to train me better, I think. So I'm working on it, but I think, you know, whatever, I think I need to understand what communication would be best. And if it's, you know, face to face and then followed by an email for those that couldn't attend, I'm open to those kind of things. I've done those things in the past, um, when Lisa Madigan did her all-out attack, you know, and it was just a broad sweeping attack, you know, we we were caught in that, and it it was highly offensive to the students, and it was highly offensive to the people that worked there that had dedicated their lives to these students, and you know, we were all stereotyped, and you know, we were all criminals, and we were all these things, and. She'd never even been to our campus. She had never even had a conversation with either anyone that I knew of. And so um, it, it's those kind of things. So that's when I started saying, let's let's have meetings. Let's, you know, if you can come, you can come. And we had three sets of schedules because our last class ended at midnight. Um, and, it, you know, we were moving. <laughs> we were moving through our curriculum. So, um it means then that I was there at three different times, and that's fine because if that message is that important, it's going to happen. So, it's me again. Um, so, talking about like semesters, are you thinking about maybe changing our like? going to terms instead of semesters or, you know, our mm -hmm. schedule of 
That's what I see. And if you, would you fill me in on that, maybe? Would I fill you in? No, I'm running. <laughs> uh, I don't change. I would never change anything without, you know, trying to, to get as much discussion as we can. Um, I know that we've had discussions in instructional team about it seems like this place has a very long semester for me. Um, I, it, I think it equates out to 17 weeks, and that's a long time. Um, and then when I poured, pulled the board policy, it actually talks about the credit hours being on based on a 15 week. So I know we've had discussions in the instructional team about these semesters and how did we get here and looking and I've personally just gone and looked at other institutions to see what they're doing and I think what we have to do is all we have to make sure that everybody's brought in on it and how does that impact math how does it impact you know uh, business how does it impact biology and, and nursing and dental hygiene and what does it do to the campus out in Carthage as far as the staff and those kind of things so recruiting um, advising all of those pieces I think we need to look at um, if we make those kind of changes I talked about in um, and I can't honestly tell you who but like Culver Stockton does a 12 week semester and then a three week semester and that they use that a lot for their international trips and so you know there's a lot of different things out there that people are doing creatively and it, it I'm not opposed to things. I think we just need to, again, understand how does it impact financial aid, how does it impact advising, the catalog, all of those things. So. Am I what? Am I a pet lover? Yes. I've had ferrets. I've had um, dogs. I have dogs now. So I love them, but I don't know if they love me. <laughs> Um, hello. Hello. Um, wondering what, what do you believe is the biggest challenge that the next president of Carl Sandburg College will face? I think part of the challenge is making sure we continue to do what's right and what's worked. And, um, you know, I, and it, it hasn't happened. It didn't happen to me here, but it's happened at every other place I've gone. And when you walk in, doesn't matter what position you have, somebody's coming in and telling you, historically, this is what we did and this is what we should be doing. It hasn't happened here as, as much, you know. Um, only when I've asked, so how have you guys done that more? But I think it's to recognize the things. I, I think the big challenge is to recognize what we do well and to embrace that and to see where can we improve? And so I think you have the, you always have budget um, issues in the enrollment. And I think those go hand in hand. I think communication is going to be key. I think that this institution is undergoing um, change in a very short, a very large amount of change in a very short amount of time. And I think it's about making sure that um, people feel good about those changes because change, you know, I've obviously been through a lot of it and I'm okay with it, but I, there are a lot of people that it doesn't make feel good. And I think we need to recognize that and, 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 and see that everything is going to be okay and then continue on. And so I think that's a huge challenge to make people feel secure with change. And then, so you have the budget, the enrollment, I think the idea of the change. And then I think the, the third thing is pushing us towards the future. And because then that kind of comes with that change of that I'm not, I'm not thinking that we, we need to make a huge mark or anything like that. We just need to start having a quiet sense of urgency that we need to start doing things and, and kind of wake up out of complicity. Okay, now the financial aid question. We find more and more families are not prepared to pay for college expenses, even the low cost of a community college. What do you see as the role of community colleges in making college affordable and reducing the burden of student loan debt? I think that we have to, um, I think some of the financial literacy things are good. I think we need to do that. I think, um, I, you know, 
we didn't, I, I, you're probably going to see a change in attitude with the generation that has just gone through that recession. Because when you look at my parents and my relatives, they were in the depression. And so there was a fiscal responsibility that lived with them forever and continues to this day to live with them. And so I think that you have in between there some, uh, we're getting where that the, nobody had that in their family as much. And so I think the whole idea of the, phys, the financial literacy is really important for people because it's really hard to understand some of those pieces that when, when the job market fell out and, and those kind of pieces. So I think that's really important. I think the, the, the things that you can do to help students and families understand what the investment is and how, how does this play out in the long run, I think that's incredibly important because you're not thinking about that as a student at all. You're thinking about, I'm going to go here and I'm going to do this and this is going to happen. And you don't think about tuition. And I can tell you that I can remember going to St. Louis U in the summertime, and, I, and they offered a deal in the summertime it was half the tuition. So I was like going to gobble that that up, right? You know. So I registered for all the classes, and I miscalculated how much this was going to cost. And I worked, you know, I was working four jobs. I was going to pay for it. And so I was standing there writing the check. And, you know, I had out to St. Louis U. And then they told me the amount. And I, I'm not kidding, my shins started to sweat. <laughs> and I can remember that feeling. And that's a feeling that I never wanted anybody to have. And I never wanted to have it again. And so I think that... You know, we need to try and do more of that up front, and I think we need to try to get to some of the high schools and even almost to the middle school and start talking about some of these things because these are things that, you know, parents didn't have to think about for a long time in between, you know, that depression. And I know we've had recessions, but it was a big one, this, this last one. But it, until then, things were fairly fluid. So I think those kind of pieces, as much as we can educate people, it's really important. And, you know, and, you know, you look at that first, that large amount, and then talking to people, how can we break that down? And this is what you can apply for. There are so many scholarships that go you know, unused, and it's not a bad thing to get a scholarship. It's a great thing in promoting that and all the different financial opportunities that are available for you, and I think we need to get people educated in that way. Mm. Hi, Dr. Crow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Mike Person. Um, how would you, as the next president um, of Carl Sandburg College, champion diversity in the college as well as outside in the community? I think, um, I, I just think diversity occurs in many different ways. You know, I think it can occur um, through ethnicity, it can, through geographical location, it can occur in so many different ways. And I think you have to embrace it because not everybody walks to the table having the same experiences um, or the same perceptions. And so I think as much as we can support that and create that, it's, it's phenomenal. I, I look at the things that I've gone through and I would not have had half the experiences if I didn't have that variety of people in my life. And it's just opened up my eyes to different perspectives. And I think we owe that to everybody to have that experience if we can offer it. And um, I think diversity is so important because I look at people and it, I am always amazed when you start a conversation with somebody and the things they've gone through. And you don't have any idea looking at them that somebody has endured that or gone through that or or had that experience. And so it truly gives you an appreciation not only for what you've experienced, but for, for what you haven't had to experience. And I, I think that's important. And so when we're making decisions or when we're evolving as an institution, having that diverse perspective is an, is an important part because you can't know all or see all. 
and you really need that input from as many sources as you can. So I think diversity is something that you, you support, you demonstrate in an appreciation for, and when the opportunity is available, you embrace it and you make sure that it becomes a part of the institution. Again, as a member of the tutoring center here at Sandberg, what do you see as a role for the tutoring center in the future? I know you spoke earlier about the student just encouraging them to get the D to get by. Mm -hmm. How well do you see us in the future making a difference and making sure that student doesn't just get the D and it gets through there? Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes if you get a D, that's a score. Depending upon where you started from, you gotta, always got to keep that perspective. Um, I think that, you know, all, all of the services that an institution offers, if you're not trying to bring them all in together and encompass them in some way, shape, or form, they're not going to be effective. So if you keep every service in isolation and silos and they never intersect, they're not going to be effective. So, and that goes for tutoring. So, um, I've created tutoring uh, programs where I've been where there hasn't been any. And I really think that if we want tutoring to be effective, we need to have faculty input. We need to have them giving the information to to the tutoring uh, center and the tutors themselves to understand what. What are you looking for? What, you, what can I help you with? And also being those person maybe to say to the tutor, this is, this is a key part. Because it's often that somebody explaining it in a different way, and I hate this story, but I shared it this morning, so I'll share it again. Um, when I, I am not a fan of school. I know I stand here asking to be your president, and I'm not a fan of school. But I think part of that is because it was so hard for me. And um, there was a, a, a moment that we don't, we don't think alike. You will never, ever, ever think like I think. And there are people in here that can attest to that. But I can remember the moment at which I was devastated to realize that I didn't think like everybody else. And it was uh, in younger years, and it was a science exam, and it was a final <laughs> exam. And it was, um, the teacher was, you know, using those innovative strategies and said, you're a piece of pizza about to be eaten, tell of your adventures. Well, <laughs> you know, most people go, okay, so go into the mouth, the saliva, the digestive system, blah, blah, blah. And I mean, mm -mm, and I, this is when I'm thankful my parents don't have internet. So I, I know I haven't told them this story. Um, not me. I was, hey, I'm a piece of pizza. It is hot in this oven. Really, Ellen? Really? What were you thinking? And whew. I can hardly wait to get in that box and be delivered. And, you know, I was all into my creative juices were flowing. And I did get to the part, and I can only imagine what my teacher was doing. She was reading this, you know. I did get a little bit into the sciences, and, you know, I, I think she felt sorry for me, so I passed. But um, I can remember going, hey, what'd you put for, you know. And so they told me, I was like, <laughs> You know, your heart was like when I was standing there writing that check. Sweat breaks out all over your body. This is a final exam. I'm not going to go on, you know. And and then they go, what did you put? And I told me, like, you did what? And I can remember that moment. And it was a horrible moment. But it was also probably a really good moment for me to realize I need to, like, start thinking like other people a little bit or get some help. And so... So I did, and when, when uh, so I got to the point that in high school, I sat next to um, a person who was very bright and never had any problem raising their hand. You know, that, oh, I know, I know. And I almost didn't pass classes because I wouldn't participate because of the pizza incident. So <laughs> I, would, I would tell my friend the answer, and she'd be like, oh, and oh, that was a great idea. And she'd be like, yeah, nice one. And, but we're still friends, it's fine, because that was, the, and that's how I got through, you know. But then we would have those conversations, and 
through those discussions, I understood some of the things that were being said that I didn't get before. And that's really where that tutor comes in. It's a different voice. It's a different process. It's a different, this is how I do it, and, and you can do it too. And so we need those kind of things. But we need faculty input or whoever they're tutoring for or whatever to say, this is where we got to get. And so it really needs to be kind of a joint piece, I think. Um, because I don't want the tutor telling somebody differently than what the main idea is, and I want to have that discussion with them. So, mm -hmm. I don't want to hear the pizza story again. <laughs> Perfect. You want this? No. <laughs> it's, real, it's really attractive. <laughs> well, that concludes our open forum. Thank you so much for your questions and participation. Uh, please remember that to provide feedback regarding Dr. Crow, please go to the presidential search webpage, and there is a survey that you can click on. I would appreciate your participation in that. And Dr. Crow, thank you so much for answering our questions. How long are the feedback surveys going to be open? That is the question. What is it? Through next Friday. Through next Friday. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Okay, you bet. Thank you, guys.